Hi, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Hi everybody, my name is Kevin Yu, and I'm from HKN, and today I want to talk to you all about some resources that you have available to you. So these are all tutoring resources that you can access. So CSUA offers tutoring services. Their office hours are on weekdays, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., and their office is located in 311 Soda. UPE also offers tutoring, and their tutoring hours are from 11, to 5, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. And their office is in 346 Soda. And HKN also has tutoring hours. Their tutoring hours are 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. And their offices are 290 Cori and 345 Soda. Uh, CSM also offers tutoring, but they do something a bit different. They have small group tutoring sessions. They also offer review sessions. And they, they create study materials for lower division EE and CS courses. So if you have any more questions or if you'd like more information, feel free to visit any of the links on the slide. So uh, HCN's website is hcn.mu slash tutor. Uh, CSUA's website uh, is up there, csua.berkeley.edu slash tutoring. And here are the other links to the other organizations. So if you're ever struggling or you feel like you want more help with conceptual questions or you want to review for midterm, feel free to drop by any of these office hours and also any of the review sessions that come up. Thank you. The audio programming for today has been postponed in interest of not watching an ad. Okay, let's get started with the lecture. Settle down. 
Once again, I want to issue a reminder that says, as you can see, there's plenty of seats in class. All of the freshmen and junior transfers, please make sure you are coming to class. There's a reason we have live lectures. We believe it will benefit you more. I highly, highly encourage you to come, tell your friends to come. Those of you who are watching the webcast, I would like to see you here. Um, other reminders, homework two is due uh, tomorrow. There's homework party today. There's a bunch of office hours today and tomorrow. If things are confusing, please come by. It's always easier for uh, us to talk to you at homework party or in office hours than answering questions on Piazza. You will also learn more through talking to a TA or to an ASC or to one of us. So please come if you have questions about the homework. A bunch of people have been posting questions about extra credit. Um, we have a TA who has uh, kindly volunteered to be in charge of actually mentoring people through their extra credit problems and giving them feedback and assessing you know, uh, whether or not they're worth extra credit. So please email your contributions to Michael Kelman. Also post them to the Piazza thread. Please do both. The point of posting to the Piazza thread is so you can share with your classmates. It's not worth it to do something cool if you only see it for yourself. The point of these extra credit activities is to create something that can be a learning tool for others. So post to the Piazza thread, email Michael, and um, you know we can answer your questions about extra credit that way. Um, OK, so today we're going to continue where we left off from last time. We're going to talk a little bit more about span uh, and Gaussian elimination. And then we're going to get into where we started, uh, where, what we started last time is talking about uh, matrix vector multiplication as a transformation. And we'll talk about different kinds of transformations. We'll talk about the identity transformation. Um, and then we will come finally to talking about inverse transformations. How do we get back to where we were before, before we went through a transformation? So this forward and backward processing is what we will get to talking about today. But I wanted to start with a question that actually was motivated by something, uh, motivated by a question that someone asked me in office hours. So I have an exercise for everyone. Show that the span of this set is R3. So we've talked about this in class last time. Um, just take a minute and try and work it out. Make sure you have someone to talk to. Talk to your neighbor. Do the problem together. This is one of the reasons you should come to lecture. You get to do it together. R2, yes, thank you. R2. You're So how many people know how to solve this? I'm not going to call on people. How many people think they know how to show this? Seems like most people. How many people need like another 30 seconds? OK, 30 seconds more. Feel free to talk to people. Ask questions. Give hints. Be kind.
Okay, 30 seconds are up. So does anyone want to share their approach? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what did he say? He said, consider any vector in R2 and show that you can achieve this vector as a matrix vector product. And he said, choose a vector in R3. So he said, let's consider this matrix. 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 3 times... Let's say x1, x2, x3 equal to b1, b2. And why did he say this? Because what does it mean to be in the span of the columns of a matrix? What does it mean to be in the span of these three vectors? Can someone remind me what the definition of span is? Yeah? Exactly. What did she say? She said that you want to show that any vector, that if a, a vector is in the span of a set of vectors, if this vector can be expressed as a linear combination of the three vectors. And what do we know about matrix vector multiplication? This is a way of representing a linear combination of the three column vectors, right? So now, if we wanted to solve this equation, what would we do? There's basically one way we've been solving systems of linear equations. Gaussian elimination, right? So how do you do Gaussian elimination on this? If I was to do Gaussian elimination, what's the operation that I would want to do? Can people shout it out? R2 minus R1, right? So I have 1, 2, 1, B1, b2, and I have, I get a 0 here, a 0 here, and a 2 here, and here I get b2 minus b1, right? Does everybody see that? So what does this mean? How can I solve this system now? 2 times what variable gives me b2 minus b1? I mean, the back substitution part of Gaussian elimination right now, right? So now I would divide this by 2. r2 divided by 2. 1, 2, 1, b1. 0, 0, 1, b2 minus b1 by 2. So what do I get? What is my x3? b2 minus b1 divided by 2. But now when you look at this, so now what do I do? Then I back substitute, and I get 1x1 plus 2x2 plus b2 minus b1 by 2 is equal to b1, right? When I take my value of x3 and substitute it back into this equation. And how many solutions does this system of equations have? Infinite solutions, right? But kind of where did that row of zeros go that we were talking about always? Remember, we always talked about if you have no solutions or if you have infinite, what is our, what is our flag for, oh, is there something going on here? Right, we always said, look for a row of zeros. So where is that row of zeros showing up in this situation? It turns out that here, this row of zeros is a little bit hidden. And actually, when you have a situation where you have fewer unknowns than you have, um, sorry, sorry, when you have fewer equations than you have unknowns. So here, we have three unknowns, three free variables, and we have two equations, right? What you can do is you can think of basically a third row, 0, 0, 0, 
So what is this? 0 times x1 plus 0 times x2 plus 0 times x3. I can add a consistent equation, which is an equation of zeros. Do you see what I did here? Did I change the fundamental system of equations that we were thinking about? Did anything change? I just wrote 0 equal to 0. So what would I write here, similarly? 0, 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0, 0. So our row of zeros that was going to tell us that there is going to be you know, not a unique solution. So there might be either an infinite number of solutions or no solutions, is actually hidden in here in the case that you have fewer uh, unknowns, fewer equations than unknowns. But is it always true that if you have fewer equations than unknowns, you have an infinite number of solutions? No. Why? Because you might have inconsistent equations, right? So here, you have an infinite number of solutions. But a problem to go home and try is what happens for this case. You have 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3. This is homework. Optional homework, but please do it. <laughs> and um, what about this case? 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. Remember, to know if we have infinite solutions or no solutions, we need to consider the values on the B vector. But to know whether or not there's a unique solution, all that we care about is exactly what this A matrix is. Is that clear to everyone? This is just something I wanted to bring up. Yeah, question. Great question. What was the question? The question was that if you can, you know, if you can do this for this system of equations, why don't I just take any matrix and I'll just always add a system of a row of zeros at the bottom and say, hey, here's my row of zeros. You can only do this in the case where your matrix is more wide than it is tall. So you can only do this to make sure that you have the same number of, until you have the same number of equations as unknowns. But once you have the same number of equations as unknowns, or more equations than less unknowns, adding this row of zeros is not allowed. Even once you add the row of zeros, you have to go through the process of Gaussian elimination to get that upper triangular matrix. So here, for example, even after we added this row of zeros, we still used this upper triangular matrix. So basically, if I had a situation where I had, you know, a lot of equations and very few unknowns, adding a row of zeros here isn't allowed. You can at most, so example, here I have three unknowns. I can at most have three equations when I'm adding this row of zeros. I cannot add a fourth equation. Does that make sense? That was a good question. Yeah. So the question is, can you do the same thing with columns? In this case, when we're thinking about a matrix as a system of equations, the columns represent the number of unknowns. So adding a column is adding an unknown, which is completely, like it's not, you can't add an unknown in a consistent way. You can add a zero equal to zero equation, but adding an unknown to your system is a whole other ball game. So you cannot do the same thing with columns. When you're using matrix vector multiplication to represent a system of equations, the columns mean something different from rows. And you know, they're very related, but they are different. And you know, part of the point of these next few lectures is to help you understand the connection between columns and rows. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. The question was, can you have shown that vector 1 and vector 2 are linearly dependent, and therefore you can only work with two vectors? 
The answer is yes. You can say that basically anywhere you can get with vector 1, you can also get with vector 2. You don't need to consider both of them. But if you wanted to do that out in the homework or an exam, you would first have to write out a part where you showed that they are linearly dependent and said that then we are looking at the span of the remaining two. The reason I wanted to illustrate this was just so that you can get a sense of um, you know, what happens when you have uh, fewer unknowns, when you have this extra degree of freedom. Last question, yeah. Yeah, the question was, if you add a zero vector to your set, it won't change the span. Yes, this is very related to the question on linear dependence, right? Because the zero vector is in the span of every single set, of every single set of vectors, right? You can always take any vector, scale it by zero, to get the zero vector. So you're right, adding the zero vector to any set of uh, vectors never changes the span of that set. Um, that's different, right? You're adding a column of zeros. So you're, you're saying that if I just add a column of zeros and add, make sure that there is zero weight, um, the span of the set will not change. Yes, you're right. But you don't want to be thinking about that when you're trying to solve systems of linear equations. Like, you're right that adding that column will not change anything from the perspective of computing the span. But you might want to be doing something different with that system of equations. So just be, be very careful about it. Good point. OK. So now that we have this, I wanted to then play a little bit off of this question that was asked on linear dependence. So someone pointed out that we have these two vectors, 1, 1, and 2, 2. And they're basically the same vector with just different scaling, right? How do we try and understand these different vectors in terms of their two properties? One is their direction, and one is their scaling. So for this, I wanted to introduce a concept called the norm of a vector. So let's say we have a vector b is equal to b1, b2. Then the norm of b. is equal to the following quantity, square root of b1 squared plus b2 squared. And similarly, if I had a vector x with maybe, say, more components, x1, x2, xn, then the norm of x is equal to um, square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xn squared. And what the norm allows us to do it is it allows us to think about this concept of a unit vector. So you played with this a little bit in discussion, not in these terms, not in this language. But I think, uh, how many people went to discussion yesterday? Right? Did this vector come up? Vector v equal to cosine theta sine theta. What is the norm of this vector? 1. Where is this coming from? So if I take the norm of this vector, I can say this is equal to square root of cos square theta plus sine square theta, which is equal to 1. Right? And so now if I want to represent a vector that has angle theta but a different length, how can I represent it? Let's say I want to have a vector that is m times v. This is equal to m times cos theta sine theta. So when I'm drawing this picture out, let's say this is my angle theta. This is cos theta sine theta. So how many people remember Pythagoras' theorem? Right? So what is the length? of this vector? 1, right? Why? Because if I draw this right angle triangle here, the hypotenuse squared is the sum of the squares of the two sides. 
So this is exactly why we're defining this norm as the sum of the squares of the component, right? And now, if I wanted to take m times cos theta sine theta, I can just take this and extend it by m to m cos theta m sine theta. OK? So I just wanted to introduce this concept of norm so that you know, in case it shows up somewhere, um, you will be able to know what that terminology means. We will talk more about this as we go through the class, but you should just know what this means. OK, we good? Great. Do people need a minute to write stuff down? move this here and start writing here. OK. So now, let's go back to the water pumps that we introduced last time. So last time, we talked about this case where we have three different reservoirs, A and B and C. And some amount of water or fluid or substance is flowing from A into B. Some is flowing from B into C. Some is flowing from C into A. Some is flowing from A into C. All of these different reservoirs are connected in different ways, right? And you know, why do we care about this kind of model? So we didn't talk about it last time, but I wanted to like share why I think this is an interesting problem. So. One of the things that, you know, where you really see different reservoirs that need to be rebalanced is the power grid. So if you think about energy that is being generated, we have many different types of energy that is generated to power the electric grid, right? We have different renewable sources like solar, wind. Um, we also have, you know, different non-renewable sources, like there's coal that powers, um, some of the electric produ production, so on and so forth. And for these different types of uh, energy sources, some are way more predictable than others, right? So for example, on a cloudy day, you might not get as much solar en energy produced as you might on a bright sunny day in the summer. Or you know, some days are very windy, your wind turbines generate a lot, other days you just don't get as much wind. On the other hand, if you're burning a certain amount of coal, there's a lot more like predictability in how your power is being generated. And then you have different kinds of industries and consumers that need that power, right? So different consumers have a certain demand for a certain power at every point in time, um, or there's an industry that you know needs to have a certain power um, to be able to actually operate. And so when you have these different kinds of sources, some kinds of energy, energy is hard to store, so often you want to be able to rebalance the sources of energy so that you can actually flow energy that is being generated at one point to another point where it's actually going to get consumed. And so you often have these cases where you want to actually transfer different quantities of stuff, different quantities of this power from one place to another. We're talking about this in a very abstract level. And does this exactly map to the pumps example that we're going to do? Not really. It's not an exactly precise analogy. However, it's the, it's the spirit of things that, you know, engineers can do in their different, um, in the different roles that they'll take on. So this is just one example of how we, why we want to think about pumps. And there'll be more examples throughout the next, uh, few lectures and actually the whole class that you will see. We'll keep coming back to these pump type analogies. So let's start thinking about these pumps and let's start thinking about them in kind of one of the simplest ways possible. So let's think about a very, very simple pump system. Let's say I have a reservoir A, a reservoir B, and a reservoir C. And let's think about what happens in this very kind of simple case where every time step, all of the water from A gets put back into A. All of the water in B gets put back into B and all of the water in C gets put back into C. So let's have some variables to label this. So xA at time t, 
Let's call this the water in A at time T. Uh, oops, thank you. XB at time T is the water in B at time T. XC of T, water in C at time T. So, what is the state vector that we are concerned about? Our state vector is x of t, which is equal to xa of t, xb of t, and xc of t. Right? This time index is just representing the time. And we're interested in understanding what happens at the next time step. So what is x of t plus 1? And can we somehow relate this to x of t? So we saw this a little bit. Can someone, can you think about how we could represent this as a matrix vector multiplication? What is x t plus 1 in terms of x of t? What is happening here in this very, very simple setup? You know, we go back to the same aesthetic in 16a. You want to understand something? Go understand the simplest possible example first, then build up from that. So just take a minute, talk to your neighbor, figure out how can we represent this as a matrix vector multiplication. Okay, how many people think they know how to do it? How many people need another minute? Okay. Another 45 seconds. Okay, time's up. So I want to think about xt plus 1 as a linear transformation of x of t. So what can I say about the water in reservoir A as a function of the water in reservoir A, B, and C at the time t. What can I say about the water in reservoir A as a fun at time t plus 1 as a function of the water in the three reservoirs at time t, the previous time step? Yeah. Are they equivalent? So the question, so what is equivalent to what? Can you be a little bit more precise? Exactly. The water in reservoir A at time t plus 1 exact is exactly the same as the water in the reservoir A at the previous time step. So does the water in reservoir B affect the water in reservoir A? No. What about the water in reservoir C? So the water in reservoir A is 1 times the water in reservoir A at the previous time step. And there is no impact from B and C. Right? 
And remember, this x has these three components. So when I take this row and multiply it, I'm going to get 1 times xa plus 0 times xp xb plus 0 times xc. What is the second row going to be? What is b as a function of um, what is b at time t plus 1 as a function of the 3 at time t? What is the impact of a? And? And? And what about c? Question. You are learning what a linear transformation is. Um, a linear transformation is basically something that takes, uh, that given a set of unknowns, transforms it in a linear way. And a linear equation is something that, you know, has only things that are, that where your unknowns are only raised to the power one. So you've seen this in the practice problems, I think. It's like a linear combination. Yeah, good question. Other questions? OK, so what is this matrix called? This matrix has a special name, right? This matrix is called the identity matrix. Why? Because it's saying that when my state vector undergoes the transformation from the identity matrix, what you get out is the exact same vector. So the identity matrix is a transformation that maps a vector back to itself. Is that clear to everyone? That this is one very special kind of linear transformation. So now, let's try and explore some other linear transformations. Let's start, you know, we're starting to like think about these pumps. Let's try and start think about something slightly more complicated. So what if I tell you the following matrix Q is equal to, can you see? Yeah. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. <coughs> Can you draw the pump graph like this? Can you draw the pump graph that corresponds to this transformation matrix? We did it one way, right? We looked at the pump graph, and we drew the matrix. So let's try and go in the reverse. So take a minute, talk to your neighbor, see if you can try and figure this out. How many people think they have the answer? How many people need another second? OK, everyone has it. So does someone want to tell me what they got and how they reasoned through it? Yeah. Okay, so what he said, he said that 
Let's start with the first point you made, that all the water from C goes to A, right? So why do we think that all of the water from C goes to A? What happens when this Q matrix multiplies, let's say, x a of t, x b of t, x c of t? Exactly. So if you look at this first row, right, the first row is representing x of a at time t plus 1. Right, this product, let's now write this as a product. We have, this is q, this is xa of t plus 1, xb of t plus 1, xc of t plus 1. So xa of t plus 1 is equal to xc of t, right? Do you see what he did? So we can draw an arrow here like this. What about xb of t plus 1? xb of t plus 1 is equal to 1 times xa plus 0 times xb plus 0 times xc. So where does all of the water in b come from? Can't hear anyone. A. A. And what about C? Where does all of the water in C come from? B. So if you think about this, what are the rows representing in terms of these flows, right? These rows are basically saying, where is the inflow coming from, right? If I look at the first row, it's saying that the flow into A is coming from C. The flow into B is coming from A, and the flow into C is coming from B. Right? So these rows these are inflows. And what about the columns? What are these columns? So if I look at this, this column is representing where is the water from A going to? What is the outflow from A? Is there any outflow from A into A? No. Is there outflow from A into B? And is there any outflow from A into C? Right? So you have a 0, 1, 0. So the columns are representing the outflows. So when you have a linear transformation, remember, it's easy to forget that Usually, almost certainly, when you're trying to solve a system of linear equations or a problem, you're trying to model something in the real world. And it's always important to be able to go back and forth and remember, wait, what was that physical system I was thinking about? Can I have some kind of interpretation in the uh, you know, matrix vector equations that I'm writing out? You might not always get a clean interpretation, but very often you can, and it's really good to have this fluency to go back between you know, the interpretation and the algebra. So, okay, now we have this. So what happens now if we run the pumps twice? So we have now this matrix transformation. So now we know that if we run the pumps once, water from A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to A. What happens if we run the pumps twice? So how can I figure out what is x of t plus 2 in terms of x of t? So let's try and think about it together, right? So I know that let's say I have some water in A. The water from A goes to B in the first pump. And the water from B goes to C in the second pump, right? So I have A to B, and B goes to C, right? So I have in two pumps, what happens in two pumps? Or two pump cycles, let's call it. So where will the water, all of the water in A, where will it end up in two pump cycles? Into C. 
What will happen to all of the water in B? B will go to C and C will go to A. Right? And water in C, C will go to A, A will go to B. So is there a way that we can somehow systematically represent this? So here we're drawing it out in these arrows, with these arrows. Can you see this? But now, remember, what did we write? We knew that x of t plus 1 is equal to q times x of t, right? We can represent one pump action like this, right? What is happening at x of time t plus 2? This is equal to q times x at time t plus 1, right? Every time the pumps run, it's like this transformation q, this operator q, is operating on the state of the system, right? x is representing the state of the system at a particular time. Every time the clock takes and the pumps run, we get a new state. So x at time t plus 2 is q times x at time t plus 1. But what can we write x at time t plus 1 as? This is q times q times x of t, right? We just did this. So the question is, can we somehow use this fact to develop a better understanding of what happens when these pumps keep running? So what is Q again? Let's try and explore this guy a little bit more. So Q is the following matrix, right? 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, times 0, 0. Right, this is Q, this is Q, and then here we have X of T, right? I'm not writing out the components. So what do you want to be able to do, right? Here I have a matrix operating on a matrix, which is operating on a vector. This is a linear transformation, so I'm going to get out. What I, when I do this product, what am I going to get out? This matrix times this vector. I'm going to get a vector, right? So here I have a vector, and then I do a matrix times this vector. What am I going to get out? I'm going to get out a vector. So wouldn't it, be ni wouldn't it be nice to be able to just express this as one matrix times a vector instead of having a stack of matrices times a vector? And this is what motivates us to define the idea of Matrix, matrix multiplication. So, let me just define it for a very simple case. Let's say we have matrix A11, a12, A21, A22, 2 by 2 matrix, times B11, B12, B2, uh, B21, B2, B22. Okay? So what do we know how to do? We know really well how to do matrix vector multiplication. Can we define this in a way that really builds on that? Can we build on our understanding? So what do we have here? What if I call this vector vector b1 and I call this vector vector b2? I can rewrite this as a11, a12, a21, a22, 
times vector b1, which is this column, and vector b2 times this column. Right? I haven't done anything here. So now, what is this matrix? Let's call this matrix A. What is matrix A times vector B1? Is this something we know how to write? Right? We know this. So we can write, these are these two vectors, B1 and B2, that are stacked right next to each other. So the transformation of A times B1 will be what we get in the first column of our response. And the transformation A times B2, so take this ma matrix operated on this vector, is what we get in the second column. So what is the transformation A times B1? Right? Let's write it out here. A11, A12, A21, A22. B1, B2. This we've done many, many times. What is this? What is the first entry of this vector? Can people shout it out? A11, B1 plus A12, B2. And what about the second entry? Louder. Plus A, A22, B2. So what are we going to write here? Um, A11, B1, except what was this? This was B11 and B21. B11, B21, B11, B21. Plus A12, B21, A21, B11, plus A22, B21. And this is not really a line, but I'm just you know, putting some dots here so you, that you don't confuse these two terms. What about A times this vector B2? So you have A11, B12, plus A12, um, sorry, yeah, A11, B12, plus A12, B22, and then you have A21, B11, B12, thank you. A21, B12, and then A22, B22. So this is just this A operated on this vector B. So we have done nothing here. We are just defining what matrix matrix multiplication is. And what I'm trying to say is that it's actually not any different than many, many, many matrix vector multiplications all stacked together, right? It looks really complicated. There's a lot of notation. There's a lot of these indices floating around. But really, it's no different than something you've been doing for the past week and a half already. So let's try and actually do this now and see if it works, right? Let's see if this works. So now that we have this definition, let's consider our Q matrix. So let's consider this Q matrix times this Q matrix. So everyone take a minute and do this vector multi this do this multiplication out. Talk to your neighbors. Try to understand what this product Q times Q is. So how do you think about this, right? You have this first vector. So I'm going to take this matrix times this first vector. That's going to be the first entry of my product. This matrix times this vector, and then this matrix times this vector. So I had to do three matrix vector products to be able to understand what Q times Q is. How many people think they can do this? How many people are done? 
Okay. So most people are done. How many people need another minute? Okay. People are quiet today. For those of you that are done, check that your neighbors on both sides got the same answer that you did. Okay, how many people are done now? Almost everyone? Okay, great. So, let's do this. How do we populate the first vector here? We're going to take this row times this column, right? What do we get? 0 times 0, 0 times 1, 1 times 0, 0. What about the second element here? How did you get that? Can someone tell me how they got the second element here? Yes. Um, it's going to be 0 times 0. So tell me which row you used and which column you used. First row, second column. First row, second column. First row, second column would put you out here. Remember, if we were to do a matrix times this vector, you're going to do this row times this column, then this row times this column, then this row times this column, right? Pretend it's just a matrix vector product. So it's really easy to get a little bit tripped up in terms of whether you start with the rows or the columns. So always remember, go back to matrix vector product to remember what is where. So to get the element here, we're going to get which row? Which row are we going to use? Second row times? First column. So what are we going to get? Zero. And what about the third element here? We're going to get this third row times this first column. So we're going to get a one. OK. Now we get to look at the second vector, right? So I have this row times this column. So what do I get here? I get a one. And then what do I get here? I get a 0 and a 0. And then the last column, I get a 0. And I get a 1. And I get a 0. So this is effectively q squared. It's q times q. And let's interpret this, right? So remember. What was our pump picture? What happens in two cycles? Right? We said that in two cycles, all the water from A goes into C. Right? So when we're looking at our column perspective on outflows, in two cycles, where does all the water in A go to? According to Q. Right? This Q, this Q squared, this matrix matrix multiplication is telling us the same thing that our intuition told us. Right? Then what about where is all the water in B going to in two cycles? A. And all the water in C in two cycles is going to B. Is everyone with me there? Questions? OK. So basically, what you're seeing here is that you can use matrix matrix multiplication to represent stacks of linear transformations, right? One matrix vector multiplication is one linear transformation. But if you want to do many, many of these operators, you can use matrix matrix multiplication to actually represent this. So, OK. So two quick things about matrix matrix multiplication. One, 
matrix, matrix, multiplication does not commute. What does this mean? Ve matrix A times ma matrix B is not necessarily equal to B times A. It can be, but it isn't always. So for example, if you take the following matrix, 1, 0, 1, 1, times, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4. This is equal to 1, 2, uh, 1, 2, 4, 6. Whereas if you take 1, 2, 3, 4 times 1, 0, 1, 1, this is equal to 3, uh, 7, 2, 4. Right? A times B does not equal to B times A. This is something that is fundamentally different from algebra for scalars. Right? Scalar algebra commutes. Matrix multiplication does not commute. However, matrix multiplication is associative. So A times B times C, doesn't matter whether you do B times C first or you do A times B first. Okay? This is something that you should verify on your own. Go home and check that this actually works out. Any questions about this? Okay. So, we have to take an example. I don't have the time to do an example in class right now, so I'll re recommend you choose a third matrix. Choose a third matrix. C is equal to whatever, whatever four, five, six, seven. Try and do this example out and tell me whether it is associative or not. If it doesn't make sense, come to office hours. This is something that you should be able to verify on your own. OK, so let's go back to these pumps now, this pump example. So we've been talking about you know, one pump, two pump, three pump. What happens if we run the pumps not one time, two time, but actually three times? Where does the third pump go? We go from first pump takes us from A to B. The second pump takes us from B to C. Then what happens? From C, we go back to A. From A, we go back to B. And from B, we go back to C. So when we run these pumps three times, what is, what is the transformation we get? We get the identity transformation, right? When you run this system three times, whoop, can you see this? Okay. When you run this system three times, it becomes exactly equal to the first system that we did. Does that make sense? And so it turns out that, you know, sometimes you can do different kinds of transformations, but recover your original state. You come back to the same state vector after doing some transformations. So this really makes us want to ask, you know, this question. Oh, by the way, you should really check check for homework that Q cubed is equal to identity. Do the matrix matrix multiplication out three times and see that you actually get back the identity transformation. I don't have the time to do this in class, but it's an exercise that'll take you two minutes and is totally worth doing. So now the question is really, can we understand you know, backwards transformations in a way that doesn't necessarily have us do the same transformation forward many times? So can we understand, we've been talking about x of t plus 1 is equal to q times x of t. But can we understand x of t in terms of x of t minus 1? Can we write some kind of transformation here? And how do we go about, oops, sorry. How do we go about understanding something like that? So like, what if I told you that x of time t plus 1 was 1, 0, 0? So there was, at t plus 1, there was water in A. Uh, 
Ah. Okay. At t plus 1, there was water in A, no water in B, and no water in C. What could you say about x at time t? What could you say about the previous step? If you knew currently the water was all in A, where could it have come from? It must have come from C, right? It means that we must have had 0, 0, 1 previously. And what about if x of t plus 1 was like everything was in B? If everything was in B, where did it have to be previously? A. A. What if you had t plus 1 be equal to like maybe 2, 3, 0? So there's two units in A and three units in B. Oh, sorry, thank you. What happens if you have this situation? So if there's two units in A right now, how much must there have been in C previously? So x of t is equal to 2. And what is here? 0. And here? 3. So this is basically equal to 2 times 0, 0, 1. Remember, this x of here, this is 2 times this vector, plus two time, plus 3 times this vector, right? 2 times this plus 3 times this gives me this. So here, turns out, because these are linear transformations, I can also get 2 times this plus 3 times this um, gives me the transformation here. So not only is the forward transformation uh, a linear transformation, but so is the reverse. Question? OK, so can we do this more generally, right? We're now basically doing this guess and check for saying, well, can we figure out what happened in the previous time step? But what we want to really understand is, you know, can we do this more systematically? And by the way, the reason that you can do this as a linear combination is connected to the idea of span, um, which we talked about. So you can do this because um, you can you can have you can create one zero 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 one zero and zero zero one as a spanning set, and therefore you can use linear combinations of the transformations of that spanning set to re to represent any of the outputs. So that's one of the other reasons that you try and think about span is so that you can use these linear combinations to understand the effect of general linear transformations. We'll talk more about this eventually, but right now I don't have that much time to be able to go into it. But now, I want to think about a slightly more complex example to see if we can understand um, these inverse transformations in that case. So in this very simple example where things are circulating, we could just read stuff off. But now, what about the following pump system? You have A, B, and C. Half of the water in A goes to B. All of the water in B goes to A. Half of the water in A goes to C, and all of the water in C goes to B. So what is the state transition matrix? The Q for this pump system. Q is equal to what? So can you think about filling out the columns as outflows, or can you think about filling out the rows as inflows? How much, is how much of water is going from A into A? Zero. How much of water is going from A into A? Is there any self-loop here? No. How much of the water is going from A into B? One half. How much of the water from A is going into C? One half. How much of the water from B is going into A? One. How much of the water from B is going into B? 
What about C? Is everyone with me here? Are people following how I'm writing out this matrix? OK. And what about here? 0, 1, 0, right? We're using this inflow outflow representation to think about this. OK, so let's kind of play with it a little bit. What is x of t? What if x of t is equal to 1, 0, 0? What is x at time t plus 1? So all of the water, there's a, like basically there's water in A, but no water in B and C. This is equal to basically the water in A gets split. Half goes to B, half goes to C. So you have 0, 1 half, 1 half, right? For example, what about x of t is equal to 0, 1, 0? x of t plus 1 is equal to what? If, all, if I have water in B and nothing in a and C, what happens when I run the pump? Everything goes to A, 1, 0, 0. And then if I have X of T is equal to 0, 0, 1, I have X of T plus 1 is equal to 0, 1, 0. And now, what if I wanted to find out what happens for X of T is equal to, let's say, A, B, C. How would I do this? I would use the, the, the fact that 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1 span R3, right? So I can write this as A times, so this vector is A times 1, 0, 0, plus b times 0, 1, 0, plus c times 0, 0, 1. Is this clear to everyone? Just I'm just writing out this as a sum of these guys. And so now I can use the transformations of these guys to get the transformation of this vector. So basically, q times a, B, C is equal to A times Q times 1, 0, 0, plus B times Q times 0, 1, 0, plus C times Q times 0, 0, 1. So coming back to the question at the beginning of class, what is a linear transformation? A linear transformation is something, for example, that allows you to do this, where you can think about the outputs and linear combinations of the inputs give you linear combinations of the outputs. OK, so we have this, but now we wanted to talk about the reverse, right? What happens when you try and do things in reverse? So what if I told you that x of t was 1, 0, 0. Can you find out x of t minus 1? This is a little bit more tricky in this example, right? It's not as straightforward as the simple case. Yeah? State transition matrices are not always linear transformations. So for example, the self-driving car problem on the homework shows you a state transition where things might be uh, nonlinear. Oh, sorry, your question was state transition matrices. So if you can represent your transition as a matrix vector product, that is a linear system, assuming that the elements of your matrix are all knowns. Um, but basically, any system that can be represented, any transformation that can be represented as a matrix vector product is a linear transformation. Think of it that way. Um, I wouldn't say that. You just have to work things out. But if you can, if you can represent it as a matrix vector product, it is definitely a linear system. Yeah. If the matrix is non-square, it is still a linear transformation. Yes, last question. Uh, 
No, you would not because of the way matrix vector multiplication is set up. Outflows and inflows cannot be exchanged. Last question, OK. Yes, if you're multiplying a matrix and a vector, you can think of it as the vector being just a one column matrix. That's exactly the way we're learning to do this. OK, can we take that after class? OK, thank you. Just because I want to quickly get through something before, before lecture ends, OK? So we want to try and understand x t minus 1. Can we find a matrix p, basically, such that x t minus 1 is p times x of t? Can we represent this as a linear transformation? That is the question we want to ask. And so what do we know about this, right? Can we do something here? I want to get this into something that is closer to x of t. So what happens if I multiply both sides of this equation by q? So q times x of t minus 1 is equal to q times p times x of t. But what is q times x of t minus 1? This is just x of t, right? Equal to q times p times x of t. So what should be true about q times p if x of t is equal to q times p times x of t? Q times P should be equal to the identity matrix, right? So to find P, I just now figured out a way of thinking about it. So if I want to find such a P, I want to find a P, which is the inverse of Q, such that this is true, which gives us the definition where we can define P is the inverse of q if p times q is equal to q times p equal to identity. So in the case of inverses, matrix multiplication will commute. It's, the one, it's one exception to the general. Matrices don't commute in general. But when you're multiplying inverses, they actually do commute. But now, how do we want to go about actually finding p, right? So we have this following thing. We have q times p equal to identity. And let's write this out in our particular case, right? We have basically 0, 1 half, 1 half, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. And let's write out p. So what is p? Let's say that p, we don't know. P is our, the elements of p are, un, are unknown. So we have p11, one, one, p12. One, P13, P21, P22, P23, P31, P32, P33. Remember, P, I, J, I is the row, J is the column. And this we want to be equal to the identity matrix, which is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. OK? How many unknowns are there in this setup? Nine unknowns. How many equations are there? Nine equations, right? Because we have this row times this column, this row times this column, this row times this column. So every row column pair gives us an equation. So we have nine equations and nine unknowns, right? How did we define matrix-matrix multiplication? What did we think about? We said, let's look at these guys as vectors, right? And let's think of matrix-matrix multiplication as stacks of matrix-vector multiplication. So now, what does this mean? I can think about this setup times the first column vector, what is this going to be equal to? This matrix times this column gives me the first column here, right? Everyone see that? 1, 0, 0. What have we been doing for the past two weeks? We've been solving exactly systems like this, right? 
So now, if I wanted to invert a matrix, what would I do? Do I need to learn yet another technique for inverting a matrix? No, we do the exact same thing. We do Gaussian elimination one more time. Um, in fact, what you can do is you can actually do Gaussian elimination simultaneously for all three columns. So for this setup, what would be the augmented matrix we would write for this? 0, 1, 0, 1 half, 0, 1, 1 half, 0, 0, bar, 1, 0, 0, right? This would be the augmented matrix we would write for this setup. But remember, when we do Gaussian elimination, how do we decide when to exchange the rows or whether to you know, swap the rows, multiply row 2 by something and subtract it from row 1? Do the B values matter? The B values do not matter in deciding these operations, right? So does it matter whether we're solving for Q times P is equal to 1, 0, 0, or 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1 for the process of Gaussian elimination? No, right? So we can actually, what we can do is we can write a bigger augmented matrix. We can write 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And we can do the same Gaussian elimination procedure as though we were doing just for the first column. And just swap and add the remaining entries the same way. And we would end up with actually solving for all nine variables through the Gaussian elimination steps that would you, you would do for just one matrix uh, vector equation, right? just one system of equations. Is this clear to everyone? I'm out of time. So if you have questions, come ask me in office hours, and we'll pick up from here uh, next lecture.